Okay, so welcome back. So you are uh, you have already a question, Roa? No. <laughs> so, okay, so welcome back. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Silvina here to give this seminar, in spite uh, of uh, well, uh, she will tell us in spite of what. And Silvina is a is a uh, say scientist from uh, physicist from uh, Argentina. I think she's a, a role model for uh, uh, also uh, female scientists. And I think she will say something at the end about this. And um, to, uh, and today she will talk about her research on uh, uh, biological systems and information transmission and cell signaling. Thank you, Silvina. Okay, thank you, Matteo, for the invitation, and thank you, all of you, for, for being here. I know that you've just had an exam, so it's not, not so easy. I hope that we can go through the talk without pain. And so I tried to prepare it. I'm, my name is Silvina Ponce Dawson. I am from Argentina. I work at the University of Buenos Aires. And I structured the talk in sort of two parts. The first part is the introductory, because I knew this was part of a course. And then uh, the second part is more about the work that we've done with Alejandro Colman Lerner and Alan Gibre. Alan is a PhD student who is about to defend his thesis in a few months. And Alejandro, she's a, he's a biologist who works on systems biology at the University of Buenos Aires. So what is this thing about information in cells? Basically, cells have to sense their environment all the time. And they have to react to changes in the environment. And in some occasions, on many occasions, those changes of the environment, they are related to changes in the concentration of certain substances. Let us call them effectors, because they generate the response of the cell. So how do cells detect those changes in the concentration of the effectors? Well, they do that through binding. Cells typically have on their membrane a, some proteins that are receptors with binding sites to which these effector molecules can bind. And those effector molecules, once bound, they generate changes inside the cell. This is a scheme. A, let me see. So this is the receptor. The receptor is a protein that transverses the uh, membrane of the cell. That's called a transmembrane protein. So it has part of it is outside the cell, part of it is inside. And that's why it can relate what happen, what's happening at the, uh, in the outside to a, what, what's happening in the inside. And so what, once something gets a bound to the receptor, the receptor can change its conformation and it can induce changes inside the cells. And that a, generates what is called a signaling cascade, which is further changes that induce changes and so on. It's not, this is exa it's an example that I, I don't want to go through, but sometimes you increase the production of some substance or you activate some enzymes or in other cases you repress the activity of enzymes. And on many occasions what happens is that something changes inside the nucleus, uh, which if you, I mean in eukaryotic cells, cells that have nuclei and that have their genetic content in nuclei. And so things change in the nuclei, and that induce those changes, induce changes in what is called gene expression, so the production of proteins, and that's how the cell mounts its response. Um, one example is yeast cells, which is the system in which Alejandro works on. He, he does experiments. Um, so yeast is, the, uh, is with which you make a beer, basically. And when you have enough nutrients, those cells di just divide, simply cell division and grow in that way. But if you deprive them from nutrients, then something happens with those cells. They, 
they um, become two types of cells. They start to differentiate two types of yeast cells so that they can mate and reproduce by mating. And so how do they mate? Well, they sense the substance that the opposite sex cell a, sends out to the environment. And so, <clears throat> for example, this mat alpha cell, cell secrete uh, this substance which is called a pheromone, that is called alpha factor, that is detected by the others, the mat A cells. And mat A cells secrete an A factor. And when you, in experimentally, what they do is they grab these mat A cells only, and they put them in a dish, and then they, they throw pheromone, the pheromone they react to. And so you induce the response, the mating response, even though there is not the opposite sex in the system. And once they, they start to sense these pheromones through binding to receptors, cells start to change. They change their shape. And for example, this is a picture where you see that the, the cell develops this, what is called a shmoo, which is direct in physiolo under physiological conditions. It's shmoo that goes in the direction of the growing amount of pheromone because that is going to lead the cell to the mating partner. And so pheromone induces changes in many genes, in the ge expression of many, many genes, which is a large percentage of the total genome of the, uh, of the yeast. And they develop this shmoo. And then the cells come into contact, they mate, and they reproduce in that way. <laughs> and as I told you how this is studied experimentally, and you can uh, modify genetically the cells so that some of the proteins that they express are fluorescent, and you can look at them in the microscope. In that way, you see which proteins are expressed in response to the appearance of the pheromone. Sorry, Silvina, yes. so at the beginning you have two cells, right? Two, my, types, my, two types, yes. I mean, there are two types, like MAT A and MAT alpha. Yep. And then they mate, and then they, pro they well, produce, they are, uh, what is the end state? Well, they, they mix up their genome, it's like... Yes, so they become one. Yes, they become one. Uh, because you can have diploid or haploid type of cells. And, and so they become one, and I guess they choose one of the two types. Like but essentially, so this is not growth, no? This is, from two cells you get one. So the yeah, population but the decreases. Yes, but the others stay alive, they don't, they, I mean, well, then if you, yeah, you produce one. Yes, that's true, yes. Okay. You produce one. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the thing is that most experiments, as I told you, which is what I work more, I mean, mostly with, you don't have a partner. You just have the pheromone. And what you see is that a, they develop this shmoo and they stay. Okay. So uh, I... I don't want you to, to look at all the, all the details, but the pheromone attaches to a receptor and then you have all the signaling cascade and, and that induces the production of this shmoo. And this induces an asymmetric growth because the shmoo points to, towards the region where the pheromone concentration seems to be larger. And this is a chemotropic type of growth the cells don't displace themselves, they just grow in that direction. And, and now, a, so this is not just detecting that there is something in the environment that wasn't there. It, it's also pondering where it is at the larger concentration. So it's sort of, me it's not exactly measuring concentration, but at least it's comparing concentrations. And so how do cells do that? In this case, they would have to, to measure the gradient across their own length, for example. And what are this, the smallest differences that they can detect through binding? So one way to approach this is through information theory. And this is something that Bill Bialik um, has done for many years. He has a, an interesting book called Biophysics. 
um, it has a subtitle that I didn't write there. And our work has drawn from the, uh, from all the work of Bill Bialex. And so what I'm going to tell you about information comes from his book, basically. So let me see what information is. I, I guess most people here are from physics, but there are some biologists, so I, I wanted to introduce also this idea of information, quantitative idea of information. So let us suppose that we ask a question that can have any n different answers. Um, what is the level of, of uncertainty that we have before having the response? Once we have the response, we no longer have any absurd uncertainty. So we gain an information which is equal to the uncertainty that we had before. And a, a way to measure the uncertainty that comes from statistical mechanics is the entropy, which is a, an idea of, it's related to with which probability the different responses occur. Because if I know from, for, from starters that a, one of the responses is going to be chosen with probability one, then I don't have any uncertainty. But if they are all equally probable, then a, I have a greater uncertainty. So the, the uncertainty is related to how probable the different responses are. And well, all this uh, quantitative theory inform of information was started by a seminal work that was written by Shannon in the 40s. And he proved that the entropy was the only definition of information that uh, abides by some simple rules that I'm not going to, to discuss here. But the, um, the expression that the information has is similar to the entropy is this one. So this here PN, I'm going to a little bit use this. So PN is the probability of occurrence of the nth answer. So if I, if I do a sum over n of Pn and whatever function of, of n of the state of the nth answer, what I'm doing is a, a computing the mean of this function weighted by the probability with which the different responses can appear. So here this function is minus log 2 of Pn. Minus log 2 is the log base 2. This means that I, if I do log 2 to the log 2 of Pn, then this is Pn. This is and wraps, doing 2 to the sum, the log, and wraps the log base 2. And since the probability is less than 1, always or equal to 1, the log is always less or equal to zero, with the minus this is greater or equal to zero. And, and then what we see also is that the smallest pn is, the, uh, the largest minus log 2 is, because <coughs> a, this is a negative number, but the absolute number, the absolute value is larger and larger as Pn gets smaller and smaller. And so uh, this is telling me that what I am, when I'm doing this, what I'm averaging here, what the mean that I'm computing is of a function that is larger, the smaller the Pn is, which is, is it's measuring the uncertainty because the responses that are less likely to occur are those that give me the most uncertainty. Okay, so this is the, uh, the idea of the uh, information. And, and then with this choice of log base two, the information is measured in bits. And in one case that is particularly simple, to understand, please interrupt me if you if you need some clarification of anything. Uh, 
is if you have, suppose that the number, we, n was the, uh, n was counting the possible responses, the little k, lowercase n, so, and we had in total n responses. And if n is a power of two, then, and all the, uh, all the answers are equally probable, that, that means that each of them has a probability of occurrence one over n, capital N, which is the total number of answers, then, oh, that's my thing, I think. So, um, when I do this, Bn, this is from n equal to one to n, one over n minus log two of one over n, which is one over two to the n, and this is minus m, hmm? because this is the same, this is two to the minus m. So if I take log two, I have minus m with this uh, minus, it gives me a plus, so this is m times one over n, one over n also gets out, and this gives me n, so that this is m. So <clears throat> I have m bits of information that I gain once I read the res one of the responses when I have certainty about the response. And the way that we can think of is, let's take small n, for example, I don't know, two. So let me imagine this is a, the zero one interval. This is zero, this is one, and this is a, a segment. And, and have, I have a, two to the m is two to the two is four options. So what I'm going, and they are all equally probable, so that I'm going to divide the segment in four segments of the same length, which is one fourth. And so <clears throat> when I learn, I, I can have this response, or I can have this response, or I can have this response, or I can have this response. These are the four responses. And so, um, and when I hear the response, one of them, I, I gain two bits of information, and also two bits is what I need to identify each of these segments. Because I could say, well, when I divide the segment by two, the half, to the, the half of the segment to the left, I call it zero. Half of the segment to the left, I call it one. And then if I further divide them by two, then this I put another digit. This is zero, zero. This is zero, one. This is one, zero. This is one, one. They should be all equal equal length. And, and so two bits is what allows me also to identify each of the four responses. So um, the, uh, the entropy is not only the amount of information that we gain when we uh, listen, hear the, uh, the answer, but also is something related to how much space I need to write down the answer, to identify the answer. Anyway, now uh, let's apply this to something more biological. And in biology, noise and variability is unavoidable. And usually, it's not that you get the full answer. You ask something and you get, well, is this the answer? Well, is this with certain probability, this with another probability? more complicated. And so the idea here is that a, 
for example, if you sense the environment, you might think that the environment is in a certain number of possible states. Let's assume that you can count the states, and we call them W, the states. And then the cell observes some data that are called D. And so a, what we want to quantify is how much information the cell gains when it measures this, uh, this something, D, which could be the concentration of a, an effector, how much it learns from the state of the environment. So, um, so this is the idea of this information gain. You have on one, if, oh, this is, I, I forgot that the eraser is this thing here. So before we had the, uh, we had the entropy of the, the distribution of the probability distribution of the possible answers, and when we hear one of those answers, we simply uh, gain as much as information as the uh, initial uncertainty. Now we gain partial information somehow, and so what we are saying is we had the entropy related to the uh, all possible states. Of the, uh, of the environment. And the amount of information is subtracting from here the entropy of what we can know about the state given that I measure, I measured something. That, so this is this here is a conditional probability, is I'm, I measure, for example, in the case that we had the uh, four responses associated to four segments, maybe I, could, I can measure with this level of a um, resolution. And so I measure here. I know that I have to be the first digit is a zero. So I, I can cancel out these two. And the conditional probabilities, this occurs with probability one half, given that I know that it has to start with zero, and this is conditional probability one half. I kind of a constrain the universe of possible answers. That's the idea of the conditional probability. Um, and then what you do is you have, this is what happens when you learn one, you have one answer. But then what you do is you average over all possible answers of, the, of what you measure with the weight of each of those answers. So with their own probability, and that's, this expression here. So it's the, uh, I have the uh, entropy of all, this is kind of difficult to point, I think, here. The, uh, this is the entropy of the word, let's say, and this is the word given that I measured D, and this is the probability that D occurs. This is copied from the book, and this should have been a lowercase d, but anyway. And um, you can work it out, the, the uh, the quantities, I don't care, and, but I wanted to write down that. I, I, don't, I don't want you to actually follow the, uh, the calculation. Anyway, so mutual information is something that is useful to quantify the transmission of information also when you have noise. Because, as I told you, maybe because you have noise, you cannot detect this with this level of resolution. You can only detect it with this level of resolution. And that, that's something useful in, in biology. So anyway, so an interesting example that Bill Bialik and collaborators apply these ideas to is the uh, development of the, uh, of the uh, fly, the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. And so, which starts with a fertilized egg, and then it goes to a embryo, 
And then from something that doesn't seem very differentiated, you get a full organism here, which is the fly. So, well, things are not so homogeneous. The, uh, these drawings, these are schematic depictions where the different colors show you some substances that are involved in the expression of genes that are not distributed evenly in the embryo. And they will be involved in telling the fate of the cells that will be in, that re in those regions and whether they will become what part of the fly they will become. This is called positional information. How, how does the uh, embryo know that this part will, be, will become the head and not the, the one with the red thingy there? Anyway, so what the, uh, the, how the process works is that the position along the embryo, which is what is going to become the different parts of the, of the full body, of the organism is codified, is represented by the concentration of substances that regulate gene expression. And so the uh, question that Bill Bialik uh, asked was what is the mutual information between the concentration of one of these regulators of gene expression and the position along the embryo? And so they did it with various uh, of these regulators of gene expression. In particular, in the book, he discusses this one, which is called Hunchback. It's a protein and is a, a transcription factor. And so, um, well, this is from Bill Bialik's book. We will see a more complicated picture of transcription. Basically, this is the idea, you have DNA that has the information on how sh gene, I mean, gene, what a gene is, and that is going to be used to make a messenger RNA, it's not plotted here, and the uh, messenger RNA is going to be used to make proteins, and so, and the, this enzyme reads the information along the gene and makes, or catalyzes the, uh, the union of the uh, nucleotides that yield the uh, messenger RNA. And whether the polymerase is going to work or not depends on whether there are some transcription factors bound to the site where the uh, reading of the gene information starts. So that's the way in which you sort of regulate gene expression. Anyway. And so what they did is a, they measured, they expressed this protein in a, with a fluorescent label so that they could look at it in the microscope. And they looked at many embryos, and this is what they found. Here is, you put the, uh, the, the plot is in terms of the position over the total length of the embryos. In, in that way, you can compare embryos a, of different lengths. And also, this, this uneven distribution stays uh, while the embryo grows. So in that way, you get rid of the length, the total length of the embryo. And this is the uh, fluorescence, basically, of hunchback. And this is a, oh, here's the explanation. So there are some small dots that for me are impossible to see, but those are the individual measurements. I saw one once, but basically what you see is uh, clearly, more clearly is the uh, circles, which is the mean over 51 embryos, and then the uh, standard deviation around the means. This is the, the plot. And, and this is the fluorescence image. He's showing two proteins, hunchback is the, the one depicted in red there. And so if you associate this to the uh, level of expression that you call G, and a, you have the position X, then uh, you can compute what is the distribution of the 
gene expression, what is the probability of the gene expression for each position along the embryo, which is this conditional probability. And then you can also uh, assume that all the positions are equally probable, and then you can compute the probability G not, not conditioned. I'm not going to go through that. And, but then you can compute the, inform the mutual information. That's basically what I want to say. And what they got was a over two bits, which is different from what used to be thought before, because uh, this seems very much like an off, on-off kind of distribution with hunchback high here in the first half and zero in the second half, in the posterior half of, of the embryo. But there is a little bit more information than one bit. Anyway, so here in this, in this uh, example, all the, qu the quantities are stationary. Although the process is pretty dynamic, but they are, there is a separation of time scales, and so you can assume that what you are comparing here is pretty much stationary. But that's not always the case with transcription factors. And so, um, for example, let's go back to yeast, which is a typical <laughs> model system because it's very cheap. To, and it's, you have a zillion mutants. I mean, it's easy to introduce mutations and observe a zillion proteins anyway. So what they did was look for a, um, transcription factors that enter the nuclei in a pulsatile way. And they found many that showed pulses of nuclear localization. This is the... Uh, the images of where they, they took that from. So it's not just that a transcription factors are either there or not there in a stationary way. They can also pulsate. And many of them in the case of yeast. And furthermore, in some other experiments, what they showed was that a, this is a, another example of a yeast in which crazy one is a transcription factor that enters the nucleus in a pulsatile way in the presence of external calcium. And what you see is that if you look at the concentration, in the experiment you vary the concentration of external calcium and you look at the burst frequency, and you see that it varies with the concentration. So in some way you are encoding the uh, concentration of the external effector a, in the frequency of the nuclear of the nuclear fraction of the transcription factor, um, so th this is another example. In, this is an experiment of a student uh, of, that we co-directed with Pablo Aguilar, Nahuel Tarkovsky, and we've observed pulses of calcium in the presence of pheromone in yeast. Uh, so there. Are Examples in which you encode the strength of the stimulus, the concentration of the effector, into a frequency. And in other cases, what you do is the stimulus strength, the concentration of what's in the environment, is encoded, the increasing concentration, in increasing concentrations of something that varies sta more stationary, in particular the transcription factor. And so the question that motivated our work was why, what was the advantage of having these different ways of encoding the uh, external, the, the environment, and when one of the encoding mechanisms was better than the other. And so um, something that is interesting is that there are some transcription factors one transcription factor, that it can enter the nucleus and stay there up for a while, or it can enter in a pulsatile way, depending on the type of, of external stimulus. And so it seems like, this is an example also I'm going to discuss a little bit in more detail, a, in yeast. So here is what we call information multiplexing because you have one transcription factor, one regulator of gene expression, 
that depending on the external a effector, which is on the stress that you put on the cell, actually, the transcription factor dynamics is different, and the response it generates is going to be different because the cell responds differently to the different stresses. So it's, you use one transcription factor to modulate different genes depending on its dynamics. A, well, this is a, uh, the example in which they did the, ex the uh, experiments with three types of stresses, and they observed different types of behavior of the same transcription factor. This is averages a, over many cells. These are some individual traces, and this is increasing, increasing stress. So glucose limitation is more limited here than here. And what you see is a different behaviors. And for example, for oxida oxidative, oxidative stress is very different. And what they saw was that a, depending on whether they induce this glucose limitation or osmo osmotic stress or oxidative stress, they, a, the, uh, the transcription factor either had these pulses or not, or it had a prolonged um, elevation in the nucleus whose duration lasted more depending on this, the intensity of, this, the, of the stress. So there are different ways of encoding the external, way, the external word. That's basically what a, this example says. Um, anyway, so let me discuss a little bit more about transcription to introduce what we did. It's 20 minutes that are left, sort of. Oh. And is it? Okay. So, um, so this is from another book. It's a short version of a very famous book on molecular biology. The, by Albert et al. This is the short version of it. And so you have the information in DNA, which is a double helix, and you have these very tight bonds uh, between the nucleotides of one strand of the helix and the other. And, and this is what is called the central dogma, which is you have the gene, uh, some sequence that is, has the information to make the uh, proteins, so first what you do is create a template, which is the RNA, and then from the RNA you translate it into what is the protein. Now, and then you have the polymerase, which I've already talked about, and so you have to bring apart the two strands and be able to, to read. And this is done by the polymerase, but in Eukaryotes, it's a, well, there, there is a question here is, where does this reading start? Well, it has to find something that's called a promoter, which is a sequence on the DNA. That is where you have, you have some accessory things that will indicate to the polymerase that they can start to read. And, but this is not so easy in cells with a nucleus because DNA is packed, uh, associated with the zillion proteins, and you have to unwrap a bunch of stuff to be able to read. And then you have some a, molecules that bind that are called general uh, transcription factors that assemble on the promoter to allow the uh, polymerase to read the uh, genetic information. And there are also regulatory sequences that use, are used to switch on and off those transcription factors that we were talking about. And then you have to change the, all this packing, and this stuff is very, very complicated. And so you have all these transcription factors, effectors, etc., to regulate a gene expression. And all this mess we model in a very simple way for what we did, which is 
a, we wanted to study the differences between the three encoding strate strategies that had been found in these experiments in yeast, which was a, the uh, transcription factor uh, stayed elevated for a while inside the nucleus with a concentration of increasing amplitude with increasing strength of the external stimulus, or it stayed for a longer period of time with increasing strength of the external stimulus, or it had these pulses inside the nucleus. So we call that encoding by amplitude, duration, and frequency. And then we used a very simple model. Uh, we started with a transcription factor, uh, assuming that it could have different amplitudes or different durations or different interpulse frequencies, and then produced some um, mRNA, and which is the blue curve here. And then this is the simple transcription factor that I'm going to discuss in more detail in a bit. And we did not model the mapping from the external world onto the transcription factor. That's something that we've done after this work. And, and then we treated three types of inputs. A, for amp what we call amplitude modula modulation, it was uh, inputs in which you had one pulse of different amplitudes. In the case that we call duration modulation, it was one pulse of variable duration. In the case of what we call frequency modulation, is a bunch of pulses. And then, we, well, we integrated the uh, mRNA produced by the, uh, by the model. We tried different uh, integrals, but the ones that I'm going to discuss today is when we integrated over the whole time of the, of the simulation. And, and then, well, let me go back a little bit. And, and then we computed the mutual information between the, uh, the integral of the mRNA and either the amplitude, the duration, or the frequency of the, uh, of the transcription factor to see if there were differences. So um, I think this I'm going to skip a little bit how to make sense of this, of this simple model of transcription. Um, I'm going to, to give you a flavor of this, which is a, we can give it a, we took it from the literature and they explained it in terms of their fit in their experiments, but you can give a mechanistic explanation the idea is that you have your promoter in four possible states, and the transition from some of the states are a related to binding and unbinding of the transcription factor. And then there are transitions that are not related to the transcription factor that switches on off the, uh, the promoter, basically. So that's the way in which you can model all that mess with specific regulators of that gene, the factors that are general to le let the uh, polymerase know that they, it has to start reading there, the restructuring of the chromatin, etc. cetera. We, we have it in this way. And assuming that there is a separation of time scales so that this binding and binding of the transcription factor acts on a faster time scale than these other transitions, which are a related to the remodeling of chromatin or other things that might be slower. Um, well, then doing that a separation of time scales is that you can come back to this to this simple model in which the promoter is in only two states and the transitions are these saturating functions of the transcription factor concentration. So I had the, all the, uh, I'm not going to discuss this, which is all the, uh, how we, you can derive that, which comes from the, uh, from, from the um, separation of time scales. But the idea is to make the transition, you need two things. On one hand, you need to 
bind the, T the transcription factor and also you need to activate the promoter through other mechanisms. And that's what's here. And also the, uh, a, um, the production of um, uh, messenger RNA is also modulated by the transcription factor. So you also, you need to have the transcription factor bound and the promoter active to be able to make the messenger RNA. Anyway, so we computed the mutual information um, and, we've, and we looked for the parameters that maximized mutual information for each of these modulation types and our expectation was to f that we would be able to find like separate values of the parameters. These parameters are the ones that are here, these transition rates, the, uh, this KD, the exponent, how many molecules of transcription factor are bound and stuff like that. And that would be like identifying which promoter I mean, because we were thinking maybe when the, the transcription factor enters in pulses, then it activates a certain type of promoter characterized by these parameters. And when it enters as only one pulse, it, it activates another type of promoter. And we didn't find much of, of a difference, actually. A, we found that a, the parameters that maximized the three ways of encoding the external world were more or less in the same ballpark of values. And also the maximum information was not that different. It was between 1.5 and less than two bits. And so then we said, well, maybe, a, well, how could multiplexing work if the op optimal parameters are more or less the same for all the modulations? And so, um, uh, sorry, Silvina. Yes, yes. So it looks like uh, this is a large mutual information. Uh, you have a four-state system, right? No, 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 no. This, this, you mean because I, I plotted here. I plot. Oh, you mean the transition of the of the promoter? Yeah, the promoter no, can no, be in no. four states. So. No, no, it's not that. A, because a, and what do you mean by it? No, if we, and we, say, we actually clamped, I mean, if, it, clamped it, it, it in two. Yeah, so, I mean, what I mean is you have four states of the promoter, mm -hmm. and so that would seem to limit your uh, mutual information to at most two bits, uh, and you get 1.87, which seems uh, rather large. Yeah. Uh, I don't see how the uh, the state of the pro you say that the state of the promoter will limit the uh, information that we can translate. Uh, I I don't know the details, but say uh, I I think uh, this is uh, definitely an ingredient. No, I mean. It, it's yeah, a, it's, it's a, a very it's a simple it's a very simple model, yeah. of course. But then in the experiment, they measure more or less this amount of, of uh -huh. information. And okay, so maybe we can. Yeah, I discuss. don't know. I I so never thought in that thought in that way. I have to think about that. Anyway, so let me skip this a uh, slide because I don't want to go. And so then we said, well, maybe a. There is a different sensitivity to parameter changes of the different uh, of the different modes, and there we we did see differences. Uh, we started to change one by one the parameters, and for the different modulation modes, from the uh, the values that gave the maximum information transmission, and. And so then we said, well, if the, if the sensitivity is different, why don't we allow the uh, parameters to vary so that we are within 90% of the maximum information transmitted for a, one of the modulation types? 
And then within that set of parameter values, we looked for those that minimize another transmission mode. And so how much can we turn down the information transmission for the other mode? And that, a, well, these are projections of these um, sets of parameters, which is what we did was we, we compared duration with amplitude, maximizing duration, minimizing amplitude, then maximizing amplitude, minimizing duration, and so on. So it's six possibilities. It's like having six options of promoters. Um, and then what we found uh, was that this is the information, the mutual information, as a function of the six promoters that we picked. Each promoter is plotted with a different color. And, and then we computed for each of those promoters the mutual information when you have an input that is encoded in the duration, this is a circle, or the amplitude for these two. In this case, we compared the mutual information when you encode the input in the duration and in the frequency. Here, uh, you compare when it's, it's the amplitude and duration. Here is amplitude and frequency. And what, what you can see is that, for example, for duration, no matter which promoter you pick, you always more or less get the same information. While for frequency, when you minimize the transmission for, uh, for frequency modulated inputs, you get small transmission of information. And if you are in, the, in those promoters that maximize the transmission by frequency, you have a much larger transmission of information. So the, um, what we found was the duration was the least sensitive and frequency was very sensitive. And so that you could have some multiplexing in the sense that you could turn off the frequency modulated inputs for some promoters. And so we found promoters that could be blind to frequency modulated signals and could transmit good information for the other modulations, but we couldn't find the other option. And well, these are some examples of this is a how much RNA you produced, but I'm not going to, to discuss that. Um, and that, this agrees with some computations, experimental computations of mutual information done with this uh, transcription factor in yeast that can have these different types of behaviors. What they did was they, uh, what they can change the amount of the uh, transcription factor, and so they manipulate that experimentally. They, they can produce a prolonged accumulation of different amplitudes, or they can produce pulses of different, of different frequencies, and then they computed the mutual information. And they obtained, and what they compared was two genes, one that, that was good at frequency modulated signals, a, and the other one that was good at duration amplitude modulated signals. And what they saw was that the, uh, the one that was good for a, a frequency when you look at the amplitude, when you compute the, the, how much information it transmits for, a, for amplitude, uh, it's pretty good, the amount of information it transmits. And it also, well, it's similar how much information it transmits for frequency. But in the other case, uh, which is the one that is tuned to work for amplitude, it doesn't transmit very well for frequency, which is what we found in our theory. So you have a promoter that is blind to frequency and transmits well amplitude, but the other way around is not found. And in these experiments, they also did experiments with mutants that, they, that show that you can transmit better 
with a mutant, so the cell is not optimizing its promoters, basically. It's what they say. And our answer is maybe it's not optimizing the promoters because it's trying to make those that are good for amplitude to be as blind as possible to frequency. Anyway, so let me go to a summary. In the first half, I hope you could follow. The second half, I don't know if you followed. So what I showed was that mutual information serves to quantify the ways in which cells make representations of the world around them. Um, also, I showed that not only is in under stationary conditions that you do that, you can also use the dynamics to encode the external world. And that motivated the question of our work. <coughs> In the examples, I mostly focused on the regulation of, <coughs> of transcription. So what is the dynamics of the transcription factor? And then we discussed the case of a transcription factor that one transcription factor that could be modulated by, or could be pro state in a elevated way for a prolonged way or uh, have these bursts and encoded different stresses in different dynamics. And, and so one of the, uh, maybe this multiplexing is the reason to use these different encoding strat strategies. So you save in transcription factors. You have one transcription factor and you can transmit many different signals using different dynamics. And well, for a future talk, how does the mapping from the external world onto these different dynamics operate? And then from our work, we use that simple model of information transcription. We looked for the promoter parameters that maximized the mutual information. And we found that the main differences for the different modulation input types was the sensitivity to parameter changes. And we could find promoters that are blind to frequency modulated inputs, but uh, we couldn't find the reverse situation. And so frequency encoding is more sensitive, in, so it requires a finer tuning of the parameters that characterize the promoters that respond to frequency modulation. And also they, have, they need higher, whoops, slightly higher binding affinities, which is something that is related to the other aspects of, of transcription. So maybe the fact that some wild type promoters are not optimal from the point of view of how much information they transmit, uh, might be due to the fact that the cell evolved to a situation in which they are not optimal, they are a little suboptimal, but they are blind to another way of relying information. So this is a, my final words that I am very so glad here that are many women. And a, basically, it's important to challenge gender stereotypes and make everybody feel comfortable doing science. I mean, it's not a fight here. It's a collaborative way of working. And also in gender violence, there is a very strong movement that started in Argentina, but now it's on, in all Latin America called Ni Una Menos. So not a single less. And I say goodbye with a picture of my granddaughter who was born yesterday here in Trieste. Thank you. So questions? Yes, um, good morning and thank you for your presentation. So I, I don't know if you understood very well. So, so you said that um, uh, to encode the information, the, the three ways to encode the information, either amplitude, frequency, and, what, and duration. And you say that it depends on the, the type of parameter that we are going to use. So I, I would like to know if maybe I have a problem and I want to transcribe, I don't know, 
cascade information. So how do I behave? Am I going to check all the, the, the three type of, uh, of a transcription or there are a certain type of property that uh, if I have, I know that, okay, in this case, I'm going to use this, trans this type of transcription. Um, what do you mean from a theoretical point of view? Because this is actually with the experiments, you find that with the, uh, the cells, you see that when you subject them to different types of stimuli, different types of stresses, and you look at the transcription factor, then you see the different, the different behaviors. And this has been observed also in uh, mammalian cells and other transcription factors. So it's not a unique example of yeast, which is a very simple organism. And a, so if you want to say something about a particular system, it, you have to understand the, uh, the experiments, I would say. Then we can come and try to explain why you see what you see in the experiments. That's what we, we were wondering. What, what were the advantages of one over the other if there were some situations in you could maybe by collecting information from all these observations, you might eventually say, well, I can expect in this particular case that the, uh, that the signaling will go through frequency because frequency usually happens when, for example, promoters have slightly binding affinity for the uh, transcription factor. But a, it's, I don't know, it's a little, it's not so predictive the theory, you know? It's, it, you ne always need to go back and forth between the uh, modeling and the experiment. Thank you for the talk and congratulations on your <laughs> birth of your granddaughter. So my question is like, how did you incorporate a noise in, in the model? Like I didn't understand how did you take the noise and put it in your model? Oh, in the model, I, because I, I started to feel that uh, you were kind of getting a little tired and it was a little late and I didn't go into all the details of the model. Some steps are stochastic. Uh, I forgot to mention that we added noise to the amplitude of the transcription factor because what in, the, in the model what we do is it's like model, manipulating what's going on with the transcription factor. It's not that we are manipulating the external world and expecting a model to say what's going on with the transcription factor. We go directly to the transcription factor. So we add a little bit of noise on the amplitude of the nuclear concentration of the transcription factor. And in the case of the frequency modulated signals, what we fix is the mix interpulse frequency, but then we choose the time between two subsequent pulses from an exponential distribution with that mean. And so there is, that's the stochastic part of the whole thing. It's, that's the noise that we have in, in our model. Then the rest uh, goes uh, deterministic, and then the production of um, uh, messenger RNA is one by one. We, we count the molecules, and we just decide when we create a new molecule. So that's also stochastic. That step is stochastic. So one part is deterministic, and then there are other parts that are stochastic. And the, uh, and the noise that we add to the amplitude is important in, in the sense that that's the reason we, we have the, uh, I went through a little bit fast, but the transition from these two states that we call inactive and active of the promoter, this was, K1, and here is the concentration of the transcription factor to a, an exponent, which is called a cooperative exponent, and then it's a constant here that is called a dissociation constant that if you think of the, uh, uh, if you go from, I don't know, well, if, if you think of n equal one and you have one transcription factor binds to something, and this gives me the transcription factor bound to this, the, and this has one 
constant and this another the the, the dissociation constant is this which has units of concentration and so it tells you when this function which if you plot it as a function of the concentration of the transcription factor is a hill function that is more or less steep depending on how large n is and where this changes behavior is this kd the dissociation so a the dissociation constant in the, the when you look for the parameters that maximize the transmission it has to be relatively large because if due to noise if this is too slow too low then you can cross it very easily due to noise and you don't want that and in the case of frequency you can have it smaller and the dissociation constant is the opposite to what is called the affinity which is how strongly it binds to the uh, the binding site that I call B here. Other question? Hi, uh, thank you for your great talk. Uh, I have a question on the K parameters. So it's nice you mentioned about the work of Bialik and uh, Gregor. I think, the, if I recall, they developed their work from Drosophila embryos and later on to pseudo embryos in mice, wherein there's this notion of K on and K off in the transcriptional bursting dynamics. In your case, the case you mentioned, could you give us an intuition on what they physically mean on the different the, Ks? The different parameters? Ah, yes. The dif yes. Uh, well, the, um, as I told you, you can get them from that m a little bit more mechanistic kind of description. And so um, here is like binding and unbinding of the transcription factor is super fast. And so it's sort of in equilibrium. So this thing here is sort of the fraction of a, um, in, if you have, if you are in this four state, which I don't remember how I call it, I think like this. And I don't know. No, it wasn't like that. It wasn't zero. I think it was bound and unbound. And here you have the. Uh, the binding of, and here you have the binding. So you could, and, and then here comes over here like that. And so the, uh, the transition here, uh, you assume that it's very fast compared to the other transitions. And so that this, the fraction of, that you are here or here is more or less a, constant and this is related to the fraction of bound promoter either in the active or in the inactive state and then the, uh, the um, this k1 would be more the a little slightly slower okay. transition which is the other kind of changes that you need to produce to put the, uh, a promoter in a situation that allows the polymerase to start reading the information. And then the other, then the other step that goes to mRNA, which is also something that goes like this, this is not a transformation from P1 into this. It's the, rate, the pace at which the uh, um, transcription occurs and it comes from assuming that it can only proceed from this state when it's bound and active and that's when it's bound you need this factor and then this is the uh, transcription transcription rate from this state basic that's the uh, thank you you're welcome Any other question? So, if not, we thank again uh, okay, thank Silvina. And now, now we are free. <laughs>